welcome to the second installment of the Cultivating Deep Roots class, the how-tos of keeping your faith healthy and growing. So in week one, uh, we talked about having good soil. We explored Mark chapter four, verses one through 20, and, and verse 20 really being um, the main verse um, where Jesus lays out what having good soil really means and how to actually bear fruit. So we left the last installment with John 15, and we, we talked a bit about it, um, but I want to explore that a little further, and I'm going to read it again. So this is John 15, 1 through 11, and it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So let's go back to verse one. Um, so I looked up what vine dresser means um, and that was the word that was describing God the Father. And a vine dresser is a person who prunes, trains, and cultivates vines. So that makes sense. Um, so that's how Jesus is describing God the Father, that he is the one who's pruning, training, and cultivating these vines. Um, Jesus is actually honoring the Father by saying He's by, by saying Jesus is the vine, but my Father is the one who is cultivating me, training me, pruning me. Um, so in verse 2, um, it mentions that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Um, and... Before, before he's saying, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, then it be, that it may bear more fruit. Um, the Lord disciplines and, and attempts um, to discipline before throwing these branches away in the fire. Um, in verses four through five, um, he's talking about that the, we cannot bear fruit by ourselves, that vines cannot bear fruit unto themselves unless they are connected to him, connected to the vine. And there is no fruit apart from the Lord. Doing everything unto the Lord, and we hear this a lot, do everything is unto the Lord. And that's another passage of scripture. And it's important. Um, but I think sometimes we get this, this misconstrued notion that the only people that can do as unto the Lord are pastors, worship leaders, people who do this on a full-time basis, and that's just not true. Um, doing everything unto the Lord is more about mindset and intention rather than the action itself. In Colossians 3, 18 through 25, um, it goes on to explain this a little bit further. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdo wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. So when we talk about abiding and bearing fruit, and we want to live our everyday lives demonstrating this fruit, what he's saying here, 
when we when we do these things that are described in Colossians 3, 18 through 25, um, when we're good employees, when we are good wives, good husbands, when we are gentle with our children, when um, when we are demonstrating our the, the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit to those around us, those are all things that are demonstrating us being connected to the vine. And in verse 7, here he says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And what he's saying is there are stipulations to the Lord lavishing favor and giving whatever we ask. Jesus knew that his words, if his words were abiding in us, and that we would not ask for things apart from his will. So in verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Fruit is the proof. When the Bible repeats itself, we take notice. Um, this is this is a theme throughout the New Testament. We talk about fruit, bearing fruit. That is, and so you prove to be my disciples. This is not the first time or the last time that we hear about this. So in verse nine, he talks about love, abiding in his love. And verse ten, we prove our commitment to the Word, our commitment to Jesus, by our fruit. But we prove our love, our love for the Lord by keeping his commandments. That's what he's laying out for us here. And I, I can't help but think how hollow our words of love must seem to the Lord when our actions prove otherwise. And that's a, that's a tough spot to be in. And, I, and I, this, every time I teach someone this or, or I share this with someone, it, it grips me again. Um, that I, I don't want to be hollow in my, in, my, in my words, and I certainly don't want to be hollow in my actions. That if, if the Lord is laying out how we are to love Him, how we prove that we love Him, then we should take notice and we should listen to that. Um, so often um, we feel that love is such an emotional thing, but it really does require action. Um, it does require proof sometimes. And our proof that we love the Lord is how well we keep his commandments. How grieved we are when we don't. And how committed we are to making it right when we know that we've missed the mark. So now let's talk about how to be hearers of the word, which is the second part of what Jesus is asking us to do in Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 20. To be a hearer of the word, simply, and this is going to sound silly, you must place yourself in opportunities to hear the word. <laughs> um, and we have to do that both privately and corporately with other believers. So what we just described in John chapter 15 is the privately part. Um, that's the part where um, we privately seek the word, that we privately hear the word, that we seek it out. But corporately is also incredibly important. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What he's really saying in Hebrews is that we, we should be assembling. We should be meeting together. Um, we should be doing that and, and, and considering how. And he's saying, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. We've all been there where we have been inspired and really our, our soul has been stirred by the good works and love of another believer. It happens all the time. And we should be 
we should be aspiring to do that for one another, to, to stir up love and good works in one another. And let's talk about assembly. And this is a lot of this is a lot of verses. We're gonna read First Corinthians twelve, the entire thing, and, and stick with me here. Um, it's a lot of verses, but it's incredibly important. It, it gives context for spiritual gifts and using them in assembly. It says now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So all of that to say, there was a there was a lot of content in there, a lot of verses. But what but what is the whole main thing behind it is that we have to assemble. We have to come together. Each church, each body of Christ is made up of all of these members and are all important. And when we come together, again, we stir up good works in one one another. We contribute something unique. And it's where we hear the word. And whether that's only from the pastor or whoever is teaching, or we really should be encouraging one another in scripture and hearing the word just with all of us. Um, But it's where we hear the word. And we have to put ourselves in a position to be able to hear the word whether that's from, again, the pastor or from one another. If we don't do that, then we're missing out on this part 
this essential part of having good soil. So the gifts are freely demonstrated and lavished on other believers in assembly. When we come together, he's, he's describing here all of these gifts and all of these things that we bring together and we lavish on other believers and people who are in need in the context of assembly. And all that to say, nothing will replace that personal abide that he's talking about in John 15. But we have to have both. We have to have the personal abide and we have to have the corporate assembly. But in that personal abide is where the word truly takes root. If we have any hope of stirring up good works and love in one another, and if we have any hope of lavishing the gifts of the Spirit and bringing our gifts and talents to the corporate assembly, we have to do the personal abide or we're no good to anyone. We have to be cultivating deep roots. We have to be maintaining good soil and we have to be bearing fruit to be useful and to be a blessing to other believers when we come together in corporate assembly to hear the word. So if you're finding it difficult for things to take root in your quiet time in that personal abide time, check what kind of soil that you have. Do you have the rocky soil? Is, is any hope for growing fruit scorched by the sun? Is, is the seed being stolen um, by Satan through manipulation of the word um, or introducing doubt? It's important that we do this self-reflection, that we ask the Lord, that we ask the Holy Spirit, what kind of soil do I have in my heart? And if it's not good soil, then we need to explore what kind of soil it is. Let's get to the root of what's happening. But when we have that good soil and we start to prioritize hearing the word and then we, we take it a step further and we accept it and we'll get into that in the next installment. And when we start bearing fruit, there's really no going back after that. So that concludes our second installment and I can't wait to tell you next time about how to be acceptors of the word.